All right, we're back in this snowy day. Uh, Comp 308, um, it is the winter 2017 semester. Um, week three, part one of our broadcasts on this lovely Saturday. Um, and we're talking today about Express. There's a couple things I want to talk about today. One of them is the assignment, which is due next week, right? Because today, oh, is it due? Is it the next week or five, week five? It's week five. So let's talk about week four. Next week, I'm going to do a, a checkpoint for your assignment uh, where I check to see how you're doing with it. Remember, you're kind of coming up with this, you know, portfolio site with with Express. And the thing with making any kind of website with Express, you need to know all the piece parts to it, right? So we're going to be talking about Express today. I also have a lab up uh, from last week that, that uh, I just wanted to point out to you. So if I look at uh, you know, you know, your labs, uh, lab one is create an Express server. So that's due tonight at midnight. Notice that that's when it's due. Right, so please finish that lab that was kind of posted last week. Right, um, it's worth two percent bonus uh, from your, uh, you know, for your final mark, and that means that if you notice, not a lot of people have, have submitted. So I, I would submit if I were you tonight for two percent bonus. And again, this is trying to create an express server. And I'm going to go over that well, how to do that today, anyway. Right, so you, at the end of the day, you should be able to to create, um, you know, or complete your lab, no problem. Again, it's bonus, so if you don't get it done, you don't lose anything, but you don't gain anything either, right? So um, let's not talk about that. I'm also, um, I got a kind of a longer PowerPoint today. It's 82 slides, but there are some, it's not 82 slides of like big walls of text that I'm gonna go through. Um, there is quite a bit of code in here, and the reason why I documented it is because, and it's right from the book, um, and I'm gonna talk about key points on the PowerPoint uh, because you need to know basic concepts, that's one, but at the same time, you need to have some code examples you can refer to. Um, we're also gonna look at the Express um, documentation online. We're gonna talk about that today. And something that's not in the book that we'll be covering is the Express generator. So I wanna talk about that as well. So that'll help you with your assignment. Okay, so um, let's talk about Express. So again, we're week three and we're talking about building an Express web application that's like right from chapter three in the book we're kind of on on track with uh, the stuff we're talking about last week we covered chapters one and two where we kind of did an intro to node um you know the the whole idea about how node functions connect we talked about the connect module last week right and which is very similar to what you're going to see this week um hello and uh, when you when you see the connect module when you when you worked with the connect module last week um, what we saw last week was that connect is middleware, right? Because it uses something uh, like routing. That's what it is, right? Connect is routing. And um, we're allowed to use, we can, we can construct the connect server and it's based on the node server. It's almost like we extended nodes functionality with a connect, right? And now we're gonna extend connects functionality with express. So express is a natural progression from connect. And you'll see how it actually adds quite a bit of functionality. All right, so we're gonna be really hitting things like how to install Express and creating a new Express app, uh, organizing the, you know, your project structure, which is really important in Express because we have to talk about things like folder structure and so on. Um, how to configure it a little bit uh, using Express routing, which is what we have to really talk about today. Um, EJS views, what the hell is that? What's EJS? Um, how do we serve static files? right when it comes to things like that's not web pages right or could be web pages right we're gonna we, we have to serve things like javascript in our pages too right and that can't be something we never necessarily do in a view so we're going to talk about that um how do we configure an express session we'll probably get to near the end and that's like storing variable information inside the express um session container and that's what really what it is. You have an express, you know, session container that kind of flows and every, and basically with cookies, uh, the browser will know that you've been here before and it can kind of do things like, thank you for coming back, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, it can, it can give you information about who you are and so on, right? Um, so we can do that. We can store all that in cookies. So we'll talk about that. And we're gonna use the express session information um, as we move into authentication, which is coming up on week six. So again, just a brief overview of what we're doing next week. Next week, we're getting into MongoDB for the first time. And then we're gonna head into, so with Mongoose, 
So that's a really big module. Just be aware of that. And there's going to be quite a bit of work to do in there. Um, typically, what I would do is I would spread that module out over a couple of weeks, but we're going to handle it in one. And then we're going to get right into authentication. So next week's week four. So that's Mongoose. Then we're going to get into a bit of CRUD, like with a couple of weeks of Mongo, Mongoose, and um, we're going to hit authentication afterwards. So if you look at the schedule, right? And if you uh, if you were to look at the stuff we're talking about right now, it's like this. Intro to Mongo, Mongo next week, right? where I'm gonna introduce a little bit of Mongoose as early as I can, because if I don't, all right, uh, what's gonna happen is Mongoose is just a module, an, extend, an extension of, of Node, again, an NPM package, that allows us to connect to MongoDB. So we need to talk about what MongoDB is, yes, but also how to connect to it, right? So that's another thing. Um, and then right into authentication in assignment two, right, which is week six. So by the time you get into your midterm test, um, then you're good to go with pretty much making any kind of express application. The first six weeks pretty much of this course um, is your foundation for doing everything in the second half, right? You need everything, right? It's not like you can discard something you learn in the first six weeks and then not use it in the second half. This is one of those courses that builds and it's not like it's a first half, second half, totally different modules. This is like first half, you need, you need to do everything to do the second half. If you don't have the first half, you then you're gonna, you're gonna struggle on the second half, right? So that's, that's where we're going with this. Um, again, I'm just looking at my folder structure here because it's the exact way I'm gonna talk about it. And again, I'm referring back to these books, right? So again, um, there's two books, web, web Mean Development, and there's another book, Web Application Development with Mean, both the same content, exactly the same content. One just has extra modules. And like I, the reason why I said I urge you to take a look at the bigger book is because later on when you decide to, this is the book, later on when you decide to get your, um, to start doing your project, because we have a little project in this course, it has some really cool project examples like down in the back were things like how to build a contact manager, an expense tracker, a job board, chat application, an e-commerce application, you know, an auction application, different things. They give you different examples. And the great thing about this, it gives you example code, which is the best, right? Because one of the things we struggle with is how do I do that, right? How do I how do I set up my, my my folder structure? How do I do that stuff? So this is a great place to take a look. And I'm not going to talk too much more about that, but that's the book. Um, and it's all in one place. That's another reason why I like it. Although I have to say that the original module, the module one, which is this book, the book that we're using, I mean, Web Development Second Edition, um, gives you enough to get going and there's lots of resources out there if you don't want to you know get the other one all right <clears throat> so what, without further ado let's get into this so express um if you look online and if you look at trying to find express we talked about this last week and, I, and I hopefully you guys have started your um your lab it is here it actually has its own site the other thing i want you to point point out to is ejs which is the the uh of kind of the view engine so if I look at EJS, it stands for Embedded JS. There it is, right? So that's where it comes from. And we're going to be talking about how to em em embed JavaScript in HTML. And there's other view engines that <clears throat> come with um, Express. EJS is one option, but there's a couple of other options as well. And some people choose those options instead of EJS, and we'll talk about why. The book uses EJS, so we're going to go with EJS, and I prefer it, to be honest, because it's very straightforward and uh, it's not fancy, right? Um, there's a couple things. You need to have the EJS extension for Visual Studio Code in order for you to get code hinting, right? So please, if you don't, if you don't have it already, and you may not because you don't know about it, if I launch Visual Studio Code, and I got some, some other uh, demo here that I'm doing, but let's, it doesn't matter. If I go to this, again, these these updates, these extensions update a lot. Notice that I have EJS language support for Visual Studio Code. I recommend this, right? If you don't have something like EJS language support, then when we, when we kick off an EJS file, it won't recognize as an HTML file. It'd be all black, right? So there won't be any kind of code coloring or code hinting. And um, I'm not saying that you need it, but imagine if you're trying to write a, an HTML page and you can't do things like Emmet, can't do shortcuts. Um, and you don't get any kind of code hinting on any how uh, HTML works and so on. Um, you know, it, I think it's a negative, right? So please, 
don't forget, you know, to download and install an extension. It's not the only one. If I search for EJS, right, as an example, there's also Polymer Syntax, another one. But you need at least this one. Now, notice this one is at 0 .0 0 0.01, 0 .01, right? So not like this has been updated a lot, but lots of downloads, right, which is a good kind of indication to me that it's still okay. Um, maybe one of you one day will write a better one, right, a better extension for Visual Studio Code. Uh, but, you know, what it does, again, just gives some basic code coloring for uh, EJS. All right. So that's, I just want to talk about those things and where to get some documentation uh, for those things. <clears throat> the other, uh, I got to talk about the other few engine that uh, they don't talk about right now in the book, which is called, it used to be called Jade. Jade. And um, it's kind of, if I go Jade view engine, because I got to be careful what I look for with Jade, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, Jade might be something bad, right? So when it says Express.js, uh, you know, view engines, and it basically what they call templating now, right? Um, I believe they've changed it to Pug, P-U-G. Yeah, they changed Jade to Pug. It's just a new name. I'm not sure why um, why they went to that went in that direction, but again, you can have it's built in. It's it's there's two that are built into uh, or more. Uh, for example, you could use Mustache uh, JS as well. Um, and it says it uses, so again, some popular templates that work with Express are Pug, Mustache, and EJS. The Express application generator uses Jade as a default, but it also supports several others. And we'll talk about what this is. And look what it says, Jade has to be renamed to Pug, and you can continue to use Jade in your app, and it will work just fine. However, if you want the latest updates to the template engine. So if you click on Pug, this is it. And I guess they've just changed it. I'm not sure why it was renamed. Revealed to us that Jade is a registered trademark. There we go. And as a result, a rename is needed. And after some discussion among the main, uh, the maintainers, Pug has been chosen. Okay. I'm not sure how. Maybe it was something else that they were reversed to some other kind of uh, service or application or something else like that. And again, this is an open source community, so no one wants to get sued, you know, for to, to uh, you know the improper use of a trademark or whatever. So they've renamed it. Um, so I wanted to point this out just in case you're you're someone who's like, hey, Jade's everywhere. You know, I want to use Jade. Well, now it's called Pug, right? So if you still want to use Jade, you know, it's not Jade anymore. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about these things and what what is what are the stuff we're talking? What is these? What are these view engines anyway? Right. But we're going to get there. And I'm kind of, um, you know, getting ahead of myself a little bit. Okay. So intro to Express. What is it? So this guy, we got to mention this dude, man. He has like like it says in the book, more than 500 open source projects that he's responsible for um, with the Node.js community. TJ Holowayachuk, right? Um, he is, um, you know, one of the prime contributors, I would say, and he developed Express, right? So again, what he did was he built on top of Connect, he built this framework, and that's what it is. Remember I talked about that there's three things out there. There's uh, APIs, which is like something you can tap into. There are there's a framework that kind of gives you almost like um, a structure to to to, uh, to hang your code on, right? It's almost like you know I want you, I want I want you to think, you know think about it as a coat rack, right? And your coat rack is your code, right? And you kind of put it on. So you got to use the coat rack. You can't just throw your coat on the you know your your coat on the couch, right? Um, you know that kind of stuff. You can't just like be sloppy about your code. You have to you know give it some little bit of structure, right? Um, some people also think about the frame of a house, right? You have the, the outside of the house, the envelope of the house. So you can't build a house without some kind of envelope or frame, right? And that's why it's called a framework. Um, framework's a little bit more stiff than an API in that you have to use certain piece parts to make the whole work, right? You have to follow a pattern, if you will. And there's also a platform, and, and Node.js is a platform, and platforms support multiple frameworks, right? So Express is one framework that Node.js supports, right? Also, I really like to, uh, if, we can, if we have time today, I'd really like to get into how do I deploy Express, which is one of the issues we're going to have for assignment three, assignment one, assignment three, um, when we three, uh, how do I deploy Express and where do I deploy it to? I'm going to talk about two, Azure for people who have access, right? And Heroku for people who don't have access to Azure or who, who want to go open source uh, or sorry, they're more of a, a different community there. Not quite open source. 
All right, so that's that's really um, you know who made Express and how it's based off of. Um, again, we we normally have this single server JS file to create everything, and now we're going to move away from having a single file. We're going to have multiple files now. How do we branch off? Which is going to cause some consternation because you need to know how. Remember we talked about modules last week, and a little bit of of, of um, how to connect two modules together and how to you know extend those things. We did some I talked concepts. But now we're going to actually use them this week. So let's talk about that. So this is neat. And, and, and if I go npm install express, remember that this, you can't install express like this, uh, as an example, uh, globally, right? You're not going to make a global express application, right? Later on, we're going to install the express generator. And, and to be prepared for that, I recommend we go to our terminal now or command line. Right? If you're using a PC, it's very similar. You should, at this point, have access to do the following, npm, right? Git, you should go to be able to do that. Sorry, git minus minus v. You should be able to do, <laughs> sorry, version, I'll be okay. You should be able to do those two. So git, right, sorry, let me do that again. And node, right, you should be able to do npm. You know, all those things you should be able to do on your command, uh, command prompt. If you can't do these things, power for sure, you know, those things are, things you should be able to do on your command prompt. If you can't do those things, fix your terminal, all right? You need to do that at this point. It's week three. Um, so those things are assumed that you can do some of this stuff. And if you can do any of these things, then you should be able to do the following. You should be able to do npm install express-generator, right? And then minus G for global, right? And the express generator, what it does is it's a separate CLI um, module right, that you we can use, right, where we kind of use the express generator to install express modules. And we're not going to do that in the beginning. We're going to kind of go through the rough, you know, building of our application by hand so we understand where everything happens, right? And then at the end, we're going to use express generator to kind of uh, build out, scaffold out a module with someone else's code and try and understand what's going on there. So for us, if I press enter, um, it's going to go grab the Express Generator. The latest version is 4.14. I like to keep this up to date because the Express Generator generates the latest version of Express, right? So we want to try and do that. So this is a package we're going to be using later on today. So please go grab this one. Okay. And again, I'm going to put this up on our Slack channel for everyone to know that. So if we go to, to Comp3.8, probably got some questions already. All right. Nice, nice. I guess there, people are already sharing the... Uh, of the uh, the video so again it would be so for the people who know it's npm install express dash generator and then minus g that's the uh um the command right because i think we have to put that in there because if we don't so this is the express generator command right and that'll be the the one we're going to need right um so let's get back to this so that's what we need later on Right, but for now, when you do this in a particular uh, uh, lesson or module, then what it does is it, it installs the Express middleware module. Right, it it installs it inside of our Node application. So we have some Node applications we were working with before. So let's go to lesson uh, two. So again, here's Comp three hundred eight, and I have some lessons from last week. I even have lesson two C. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna use lesson two B though, because that's the official one. And I'm going to duplicate lesson two B, and create lesson three. That's what I'm doing here. So there's lesson three. And of course, like I did last time, I like notice I only have one server module, server JS, and there's nothing else inside of it. I have node modules, which is good. I have a package.json file, but we're going to add to this lesson three. I'm going to go to my terminal, and I'm going to I'm going to kind of uh, after clearing the screen, I'm going to go cd space, and then I'm going to drag and drop my folder right into my terminal so I can get into that lesson three. I'm going to clear the screen again, and I'm going just so that you can see what I'm doing. Um, and what I want to do here is I want to remove my .git folder so we start a brand new full, uh, you know, um, repository. I've done this a number of times now, so you should be able to know how to do this. On, the, on a Mac or Linux machine, you want to do something like this. Remove minus RF. Again, recursive and forced, and then it is .git, right? So that removes that. 
On a PC, you're going to have to be able to view your hidden files and folders. Right click on the .git folder and delete it, right? Uh, that's how you do it on the PC. Now, some people asked me last time, what if I just reinitialized my Git repository? So if I went Git in it again and reinitialize, would that kill it? Does that fix it? Does that kill any of the commits? No, right? So sometimes that's a problem by reinitializing. Um, and this is the cleanest way of doing it that I know, right? Um, so that's why I do it. So now I need to reinitialize Git. And of course, the commands are git init, git add dot, git commit minus m initial commit. These are all things you should know how to do. Okay, so there's my, my first commit or initial commit. I'm going to clear my screen again. Right now, once I've done that, I need to connect somewhere online. I'm using GitHub. You can also use Bitbucket. If you so choose, some person asked me last week, what if I don't want to use GitHub, Tom? Can I use Bitbucket instead? I'm okay with that. Can we run our own GitHub? If you really want to, but it has to work, right? <laughs> if it doesn't work, people run their own Git server, Git server and Git service, and it doesn't work. Um, yeah, so I'm going to use GitHub, but you don't have to if you really don't want to. I recommend it. It's just easier. But um, some people said, well, I only have, I, I don't get unlimited repositories that are private with Git. I only get five. I said, okay. Um, I know, I saw that too. But I said, uh, no, they're like, we only get five. I'm like, well, okay, that's interesting. I thought it was unlimited. Anyways, but um, so if you only get, if you get unlimited, um, if you don't get unlimited, even if you had five and you have to do a bunch of assignments, um, how would you partition them? And they said, well, can we hand you in, um, you know, kind of, a, you know, one repository with a bunch of assignments inside because they're afraid, you know, they're going to get copied or whatever. Um, and, I, and I'm like, you know what, there's also Bitbucket. <laughs> You know, like that's you know, it comes down to you can always use two services. It's okay if you really feel afraid. They could have one repo and just have a branch. They could do all kinds of things. One repo with a bunch of branches. Yeah. There's, there's many, many ways to. You can have one or you can have different organizations. One organization uh, per assignment, right? And then, for example, you make one private repo for each organization. There's all kinds of ways to do it. Do you have to pay per organization private? Do you? Yeah, you know, even if you're on the student side. Really? For organization, private repos, yeah. All right. Let's private, go back to this private, anyway. Private so here's my um, here's Centennial, which is where we are today. And um, you know what we want to do is set up a new repository without further ado. And we're going to do comp 308. Uh, and again, uh, winter 2017. And it's lesson 3A, because we're also going to do lesson 3B later for those people who are in the B class. All right, it's public. And um, I followed everything up to here, but I, I just changed my uh, readme to add dot. And instead of first commit, I said initial commit, and I didn't do this part. I'm going to make a readme file today, and I want to talk about a little bit more about GitHub and how to fix that. If you create a readme now, that's a bad thing, because you're going to be out of sync with your local repository, especially since you haven't pushed it, right? We'll do that later. So let's say, here we go. Here's my remote add, whatever. And notice I just, the the, the the command is right here, git remote add. The name of the of the um, remote link, the link to GitHub is origin. That's the, the friendly name for it. That's all it is. You can name this whatever you want. You can name this, you know, uh, link to GitHub, you know, whatever you want, right? Um, or you can even call it GitHub if you want. Some people do that, you know, git remote add GitHub, and then the name of your, your Git repository. Um, you can do that. And then we're going to push. Pushing is uploading. Minus U for unconditional. So we're going to, for the first time only. And then to the remote. Remember, it's called origin. If you called it GitHub, it would be git push minus U GitHub. And then to the master branch, right? Master branch. Those two, li those two lines of code by default, I could use those. Go here and paste it, right? And then press enter. Um, I should be mentioning to you that one of the ways to fix problems with um, unrecognized command issues with Microsoft's Windows terminal or command prompt is to download or git dash SCM. Yeah, git bash or git dash SCM. If you go to git dash SCM and if you download this and if you follow the steps, this is not, not for Mac but for Windows, the, the Windows version, um, if you do that and if you follow the, the, the wizard that launches, it will fix your command line, right? Um, it also helps you do things like win cred the credential manager that allows you to, um, uh, you know, kind of remember who you are, so you don't have to always put in your password whenever you upload or push to get right. So or GitHub, I mean. 
So just you know, take a look at this as an option. Uh, you can go to git-scm.com. I'll put this back on. I think I already have it on Slack, but I'll put that back on there. So it's a fix. Fix git. Git or git issues locally. Git endline issues. Download. Uh, git from git-scm. Right, which is something I'd recommend, right? Because if you follow this, these kind, if you follow the command, the uh, wizard, some of them says, you know, things like um, use extended Linux commands within Windows and all this other stuff. It actually tells you a bunch of stuff in there. So follow if you watch the uh, the prompts uh, that it gives you, and you don't just go next, 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 next. When you install your uh, um, your Git, you may find that you get a really cool uh, other something else called Git Bash, right? As opposed to um, what you come up with now git bash is not um, Git shell. It's not a shell. So if you if it's not an interactive shell, so if it's because it's not an interactive shell, there's certain things like um, Bower and like NPM if you go NPM or um, no uh, NPM in it or Bower in it one of those kind of things with git bash Right it will fail because it's not an interactive shell All right, so that's one negative about it, but the great thing about it. It gives you code coloring again when it comes to doing git commands in Windows, right? So it'll actually color it nicely. And I'll show you that a little later today, right? So you see what it, what the difference is. Okay, so um, so we've set up our git repository. And let's go back to here. So now by now, you should have this. And, and to follow along, notice that I don't, I don't have many files here. I have my package.json, my git ignore file, and my server.js. But I want to add a readme file, and I'm going to add it up online, right? So I had a readme file, and notice it says, here's my COM308. Now notice there's a single hash. This is using Markdown, right? And for those people who don't know what Markdown is, um, it is another language, just like Markup, HTML. It's called Markdown, M dot, so that's why it's MD for Markdown, right? Um, and with Markdown, what you can do is this, you know, kind of, you can kind of make a message. So if I do um, a single hash, a single hash is like an H1 tag in HTML, right? But if I use a double hash down here, so double hash, that's like an H2 tag, right? And I can do something like welcome, welcome to um, plus three, right? And then if I save this, notice if I go down here, oh, by the way, there's a preview. This is neat. So you can see what it's going to look like. This is what it's going to look like, right, before you commit. So it tells you almost like a little previewer here. I've never had that before, by the way. But here's my new file. And because I'm editing and editing a new file that I don't have in my folder, I need to go down here and make a commit. And notice that the default message for making this readme file, if I want it, you know, by the way, this is all optional, but I want to show you how to do this, is create a readme, right? And if I click commit new file, it's going to add it to the master branch. Now I have two commits, right? Create readme file and initial commit. And if I go to my code base, down here, you'll see a little readme section. And you can put in things down here like how to install your project if there's special installation instructions like for example you know do an npm uh install go and then the next step is do an uh, a bower install if you want to have those manual commands to do or something else you might want to talk about your project a little bit what you did a little description all those kind of things and why am i telling you this because later on down the line i may get you to do an, a markdown file to to describe your project right not now but later um, okay, but we have a problem, right? What's the problem that we have with our Git repository? And I don't want to have the usual suspects tell me the answer, right? I want to ask some of the other people that are in the class. So what's my problem now? I have a pro I created a problem for myself, right? Can you think about what the problem is? Can you think about what my problem is? No, no, no. Those are usually, you guys are the usual suspects. I want to know from other people, right? Tell me what my problem is. What have I created? I'm going to ask, I'm, I'm going to ask people if you don't tell me, right? So. <laughs> Which file? Uh, README is on, on thing. Okay, so now, question. If I work, and this is the danger that we get into, right? If I start to work with my files locally and I do another commit, what's going to be the problem? My commits are going to be out of sync, right? Because I have two commits online. I have one commit locally. And if I continue to make something going locally and I do some more work locally and I make another commit, but this one is different than this one. There's different commits. So Git and GitHub are going to say, be I can't I can't push to the I can't push anymore because they're totally it's I'm out of sync right so to prevent all that there's a couple of easy ways to do that when we add a file remotely 
we want to pull the file locally. And the way to do that, because I've never shown you this yet, is get pull, right? It's going to pull from the from the default remote, which is origin. But if you really want to, you could specify, right? But I'm just going to say get pull. And if I do this, it's going to pull down the latest file, which is my readme file right here, right? That's what it does. So one command. Now, right, if I do a git log locally, I have two commits, my readme file, which I did online, and my local commit, which was my initial commit, OK? And my project has changed, right? So now we're in sync again. We have two commits online, two commits locally. This is an important concept, because people, students come to me a lot of times and say, Tom, I don't know why, but my, my, my repository is broken, and I can't push, right? And I'm like, did you add a readme file? They're like, yeah. Did I ask you to add a readme file? No. But it says to add a readme file online when you make your Git repository. Yes, it does. It says it recommends it. Did you add a license file? Yes. Did I tell you to add a license file? No. That means you have two files online, and you only don't have those files locally. You need to do a pull. They're like, well, what if I, I can't do it anymore because I've worked locally? Now you need to do some conflict resolution, which is a pain, right? So it's not impossible. You can always get through it, right? For example, you can always stash your changes, but that's just like discarding your changes, like locally I'm talking about, almost, right? But it puts them away, right? And if you don't know how to get them back, right, that's a bad thing. Some people are like, well, I discarded my changes because I did a stash, a git stash, and then they're gone, right? No, they're not, right? It just means that you're putting your commit that you've done locally out of sync, and you got to put it back inside the right sequence. Anyways. I just want to talk about this because people have this problem sometimes. OK, so now locally, I have this folder structure, right, which is just flat. I don't have anything local. I only have my, if I look at, if I do an ls command, I have my readme files, my node modules, which I'm not putting up online, not putting those online. I have a package.json, which is my manifest, and a server.js uh, locally. So there's my readme file, right? And what I want to do is I want to start editing my project with Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to drag and drop Lesson 3, drag it in there. And um, inside Lesson 3, now I have these files. So here's my gitignore file. The only thing that's in my gitignore file, again, is stuff that I don't want to put up on Git, GitHub. All right, so anything that's listed here, node modules, not going to go on GitHub. And if you want to hide something from GitHub, for example, proprietary pictures, pictures that are copyrighted, I mean. Um, Things that are big, builds that are huge, if you're doing Unity, right? Um, all those kind of th things. You can list the actual folder name here, and then anything inside that folder or a specific file will not be pushed to GitHub. It'll be, it'll just stay local, right? So we have a problem again. If if you were going to download my files, and you said you would say, Tom, it might your files don't work, right? And I would say, why? And you'd say, well, I tried to run it, and it says my there's no module, right? And the reason why is because we don't upload the modules, right? You've got to do an npm install. So I need to opt to update my my readme file, yeah, to tell me to tell everybody that. So here's my readme file, and notice that it gives me a little preview now, and I probably have some kind of download uh, uh, and, and uh, some kind of extension to do this, right? Maybe not. I don't know. Is it built in now? Oh, yeah. Like and, kind of, and down in here, I can do something like this. I can say, you know, use npm install, right? And I want to kind of make this bold. What's the bold command? Uh, single star. Single star, right? No. In between each of them. In between npm install. Right, oh, that's, that's this, right? npm install, use npm install. How about code, if I want to make it look like code? There's actually another, backtick. right? So I can do that for both sides. Yeah. So back tick on this side, and back tick on this side, and now it looks like npm install. Use npm install, see, the, see what I'm doing here? And you can do both. You can do this and make it bold, right? Just by putting this outside, npm install, right? And that's just some small markdown, so that way it looks like this, right? So use npm install uh, to um, I guess I guess install your project, <laughs> install your uh, project uh, dependencies. Okay, so there it is. So this is like the command, the you know, kind of an instruction on what to do. Right? It says it right there. Okay. Now, if I save, I'm one commit behind. I got a new commit that I'm going to do. Here's my commit. Right? 
I can use the Git built-in uh, Git interactive Git that I have here, or Git, um, you know, that's that's integrated. The integrated Git and GitHub module right here, right on the left. This little button right here, right. And I'm going to go over to changes. So I slide this across the changes. Notice that there's the change, and it, and it has a little M next to it. M means modified, modified file. I'm going to skip across the changes. You can also do down here. You can do the plus here. Or I can go slide, slide across, across the changes this level and click the plus here, which is going to include everything. If I have over, it says stage all. Stage all is like doing git add dot. That's the same thing. If I go down here and do this, it's like doing git add readme.md. That's the same thing. Right? If I only want I have one file. And I can choose which files I want to stage for this commit. I remember a commit is a snapshot of the current state of your project. So I want everything. So I'm going to click this. And now I'm going to make a little commit message here. I'm going to say something like updated readme file to include installation instructions. Right? Now you can be as, now it tells you what to do here. I've made a long commit and it tells me it is recommended to keep the commit's first, uh, first line under 50 characters, right? Because the second line is your description. So uh, we can try and reduce this. Right, still a little bit too long. Uh, install. I could do that. Upstate and install instructions. All right, and then just click the little little check mark, you know, as an example, and go here and push. And this will push remotely to GitHub. I'm showing you these little th these little things, so you don't have to use your command prompt all the time or command or terminal. Once you set your uh, your command prompt or terminal up, in fact, you can do most of it through this little icon right here. Right. However, sometimes if you mess up, um, the be best fix is command prompt, right, or terminal. All right, so now if I look up online, I should have three commits, right? I did one locally, and then I did a commit remotely, and then I did another commit locally. So there you go. There's your three commits here, right? And we did them all um, through our project. Any questions around this process? Because again, I want to make sure that everyone understands. I made this little commit, this little readme file, right? And I did it after the fact. So it tells everyone what to do because my, remember, my node modules will never be up on GitHub. Uh, it won't happen. I won't put them up. Okay, we have a problem. We don't, we have some stuff we want to get rid of. Um, and I'm going to talk about those things. I have this, uh, not the readme file, I have this package.json. And notice down here, I have a dependency of connect. I'm not going to use connect today, and I want to remove it, right? How do I remove my connect dependency with NPM? How do, how do I do that? I'm not going to just remove it from here. That's not really the right thing to do. In fact, I don't recommend that at all, like, you know, big cross. And another thing I have a problem with in my, in my package.json file is I have the wrong stuff. So my demo connect app for uh, lesson two doesn't make any sense. My demo express app, right, for lesson three does make sense. I got to change that, right? And my GitHub link is all wrong, right? So this is just, this should say 3A, not 3, not 2B, right? So if you, you got to check that, so 3A, these are all things that, you know, I have to change. And I want to get rid of, I might as well not, I'm not going to put up a GitHub, Git, um, my commit on GitHub yet. I also want to take away this dependency, and I'm not going to do it here. Better to do it at the terminal. What I mean by that is I need a verb to remove my dependency, right? So I don't if I don't know what it is, if I just type npm, you get a bunch of um, suggestions, right? Access, add user, bin, bugs, you know, and if you go down the line, you see install, that's the one we use to install everything. Install test, that's not right, we don't want that. There's publish, we want to publish an npm module, that's neat, right? Um, and then there's, if you go down, there's uninstall, right? There's no remove, but there's uninstall. So we need to use this uninstall verb to do the following. So npm uninstall, right? And then the name of the package you want to uninstall, which is called connect, right? So let's clear. Don't do that. npm uninstall connect. But we also want to do minus minus save to remove it from our package.json file. So if I press that and press enter, it removes it and removes all these modules. Right, that's why I wanted to do it. Now we're going to put the back in a second because we're going to do an npm um, install express. Right, 
So notice if I go back to my package.json, my dependencies are gone. There's no more dependencies. But also inside my node modules folder, my node modules folder is now empty, right? We're going to put some stuff back in there in a second, right? I'm showing you how to install and uninstall packages. You need to know how to do this sometimes, right? Now here's my terminal. I'm going to clear the screen, and I'm going to go npm install express, because that's the module we're going to use, minus minus save. Remember, the minus minus save, it tells npm to use package.json, right? Package.json, and store the dependencies here inside here. So if I put things up on GitHub, then you know you just have to push npm install, and it, and it brings that package back into life. It kind of downloads it first. I'm going to do this and press enter. Now it's going to fetch all the data, lots more stuff, right? And it installs Express because we're going to be using we're going to be using Express today inside of our node modules. Now there's, there should be, if I refresh, a bunch more node modules in here. Look, woo, lots of stuff, right? Content type, da 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 da. These are all things that are installed with Express. And we're going to install other ones too, but for now, just Express. Notice that Express at version 4.14 has been installed as a dependency for my project. Okay, now my server.js is out of date because we're using connect, and there is no connect module, right? We're going to get rid of connect. So let's get rid of some of this. I'm just going to kind of remember this is just our, our we're setting up project for our project for lesson three, and we're going to talk about these things, these these little um, commands. There's apt use. I'm going to keep some of these though, right? So let's change this into an express module, right? So for those people who are doing lab today, express, we're going to put that in there. Instead of let app is equal to connect, we're going to say we're going to call this. Uh, we're going to rename refactor, right? So we're going to rename, right? Rename the symbol from connect to express. Right? So we have express there. there is and uh, will this work? Like we just all I did was changed everything from one to the other. Well, yes and no, right? We're not quite exactly the same. Notice that I have a constant uh, for port 3000. That's good. I have listen at port, but do I need to set the headers for Express? What do you think? No, I don't need to do this anymore. That's what I'm saying. That's why Express is a little better than Connect because I can I can stop doing certain things. Here's app.use. And can I use app.use anymore too? If I go to app, it says, look, Express it tells me I can. If I couldn't, it wouldn't give me any code hinting at all, right? So I can still use this. It looks like just like connect, right? And everything's the same. All I've done is remove some lines and made this. Let's try and run this little thing the way it is, right? But first, 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 I have some changes, right? This changed to lesson three. I have a couple of packages. Where do I go again to stage everything? If I want to stage everything individually, I can choose the, each one of these uh, files, right? And my package.json, I can choose one. But I want to have kind of add them both in. So I'm going to click this little plus button again. That stage is both. And then I can do something like updated, or first of all, I added. Uh, you can, you, I could have done multiple commits here, by the way. I could have said remove the express, or remove connect. That would, be, that would have been a commit. Then I could have said added express. That could have been a commit. Then I could have said updated my server.json file. That could have been a, a commit, right? And so on, right? We're just going to say added express, right? And that's enough, right? Because I mean, if I want to get too descriptive, you know, push, we don't want to go too crazy. All right, so we did a little commit. We have another commit there. I'm doing lots of commits today because I want to show you, you should be working with your code base. So every time you do something, so you can remember what you did. Um, let me go back to this and hit our express, our server JS, right? And what I want to do is I want to test out I want to test if this works. And again, I'm going to use NodeMon. Or sorry, yeah, NodeMon for that. So click, clear. And I'm going to go NodeMon. Press Enter. And if everything goes well, everything's working on, on port 3000. And I should be able to go here and run on port 3000, localhost 3000. And I should see welcome. And if I go and try and do some routing, as an example, and if I try and route to hello, I should see hello world, right? So my routing still works. Everything worked from last week. The only thing I did was remove my header, uh, set my, I, I took away my setting my headers, right? And I have my first Express app. So that's how long, that's, that's the first step. If you're going to finish your lab last week, that would have been the first thing. Change it to Express. <laughs> remove stuff you don't need, right? Uh, which you don't need those other things. 
Okay, so this that's a, our basic express module. So it's in one file, but we're moving away from the single file structure because our express we're going to make a full web application. So we need a better structure, and we're going to talk about this in a second. All right, so we've done our first express app. Any questions about what I've done? Again, remember that there is no HTML file right now, right? We don't have HTML. All we're using is one single server.js file that serves up everything. If you don't, if you couldn't do what I did, please look up on GitHub and look at the Centennial College for slash comp 308 W2017 lesson 3A. And you can look at my code, right? So if you're if you didn't weren't able to make it go, please look at my stuff, download my example, and then so that we're on the same page. So I gotta keep moving forward. Okay, let's take a look at the PowerPoint again. So again, what we want to do is once we've done this, right, and it tells you that if we keep doing things with just one single file, it's just not scalable, right? And it becomes that way for anything. If I make a game with on the web, a web game, and who's, remember some people did web game with me, web game programming, right? And if you did web game programming, you know that well, you did partially, a bit partially, all right? So um, if you did, no, no, he didn't, he completed it. I'm saying part, he was partially with me and partially with somebody else. Anyway, so um, so what we do with web game programming, because games can be very complex, remember, is break your game up into different modules. Well, we're going to do the same thing here because this web application structure can be very complex. And if we keep if we keep it just to our server JS file, we're never going to finish. We're, we're going to be it's going to be a, a whack of stuff to look at, right? Now you could start. Some people, and I'm I'm, I'm going to tell you like this: the book says one thing, but I want to talk about what people do in real life. What people do in real life sometimes is they start with a single server.js file. And then after everything is working, they partition. And I'm telling you why. Because it's easier. That's why. Because there's no pathing involved whatsoever. You don't have to include anything. You can do in one single server.js file will take care of everything. In fact, if you really wanted to, you could use a single server.js file and no one's going to get mad at you, right? If it works that way. If you can work that way, good luck, right? I can't. It's too much work to do in one single file, and it doesn't make any sense. But um, but uh, it's not a bad way to start. Start off with one file, and then partition your stuff. Break up your installation into different files, um, and so that it becomes more, I don't know, readable. For readability's sake, please do that. How about that? Just to make it more manageable, I think it's the best way to say it. All right, so we talked about this. We've already talked about package.json last week. So they're, they're introducing it here in the book for the first time, where my Express, notice that their version, 4.8.8. Am I ahead of them or behind them? 4.8.8. This is the book that was written in 2016, the end of 2016. 4.8.8. Look at mine. All right, if I look at my package.json, right? 4.14.0. This is why I'm telling you, when we look at you know um, stuff online, we get a book. Even if even a good book, which is this one, my Express is more ahead than them. And it would be always. Whenever you look at a book and you try and do the same thing, unless I really wanted to, which I could, I could target their version. Because right now, this is the latest version, right? But um, and it'll even give you some code hinting on what it is. Look, fast, unopinionated, minimalist web framework, right? I would say it's a, a little bit opinionated, though. I disagree with that. But anyways, we'll talk about that. So the book says one thing. The book says 4.8.8. Don't be afraid of that. It means that w things have changed, right? Things have moved forward. And the reason why the book does this is so that way, if you do an example from the book, it'll work exactly this way. So if you really, if something doesn't work with what we do, we could always skip back to Express 4.8.8, and the book has been tested with that version, and it would work. Chances are. Error. I know. The leave it. Should be all leave it alone. Don't be mad. All right, let's keep going. Um, install Express. We did this already. I'm not, and it updates your thing. Now, here's something that they did. So, after creating your package, we have this structure. And look what it has app use, just like we have an app listen. Now, we don't have that, that whole uh, set the content headers. We don't need to do that anymore, like we did before. Console log. And then we have this app module exports. Now, what they've done is they said, look, you know, it says after creating your package.json file and installing your dependencies, you can now do this with your following code. But notice that it says module exports at the bottom, right? Module exports. What am I exporting to? Nothing. But let's do that anyway. Let's add that little line in there and see what it does for us. 
So if I go back to here, right, into my server.js and go to the bottom, I have a couple of routes. They only have one route. We're going to, you know, we have a couple of them, right? So we have one route for hello, and we have the generic, and again, I want to say this as the wildcard route. This is the wildcard route. When so something, anything comes to our website, it's going to hit our wildcard. This is this forward slash thing, and it'll just say welcome. So if you miss, if you try and do some other kind of command, he'll come here too, right? Um, and an example of that would be if I went to the website here and I typed something else like goodbye. It's gonna, it should give us, there's no you know thing, right? But it does, it gives us welcome, right? Be aware of that. That's what happens. It's the wildcard route. It's a catch-all, right? So this may not be what you want, right? This, 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 this kind of the way it responds here may not be the way you want it to go. And we're going to change this this structure in a second, right? But this app use again can be used as middleware routing, right? Um, where we're routing to specific, we're, we're responding with a, a specific response. Remember that there's three things that it needs. The and we're creating what is called an event listener. This is an event listener with its callback, with an anonymous callback, which is the event handler, right? So there's two parts. This part is the listener. We're listening for hello in the URL, right? And then we're responding or handling the the the, um, the response, right? So this is the request, hello, and the response is this. That's what the response is, right? And we're passing in an anonymous function because this arrow function, this fat arrow function, remember, is like doing this. This is the equivalent, right, to, to the fat arrow. And you might see it in older documentation written like this, where it's function, that's equivalent. Almost the same. Not really equivalent because Fat Arrow gives you other stuff too, but this is the closest approximation of what it did, right? So it's an anonymous inline callback function, or what, that's what normally how it looks, right? Now we use Fat Arrow, so it looks like this. That's the short way of doing it, and that's the way we do it now. But notice how it uses request, response, and next, and we have the next keyword down here, which takes us to the next, um, uh, the next request, okay? If I was to remove next, right, would it do anything appreciable to my code? Like, especially in, in Express, if I take these out and I run it, okay, now notice that when I run it, it rebooted my server because I'm using Nodemon and Nodemon restarts my server. When I make any changes on the server side, if you're not using Nodemon, you need to restart your server to, to realize those changes. Otherwise, it will not, it will not, you won't see your changes, right? Well, we did that. Nodemon does it all for us. So now if I go back and go refresh, it still gives me welcome because it's the wild card. And if I do something else, you know, good morning, right? Unless I make some weird mistake, like if I do something like, instead of good morning, I press a space in there, like something weird, right? And even then, it kind of subs in the stuff to try and make it work. It'll still come to welcome by default. And if I try and do, you know, uh, hello, It'll take me to hello world. That is recognizable. This right, is recognizable, right? Anything else like this because of my wildcard entry, right? If I do one of these, it's still going to take me back here, right? No matter what I do, okay? Because the way I've coded everything, okay? What is that smell? Is that you? It's yeah. nice. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just smell sensitive. Anyway, so that so I don't have to have those in right now. So I can take those out too. So I can reduce some of this, as you can see. Um, I'm leaving some of my code in here uh, to to take care of this. But at the bottom, I want to use this module exports. So module, if I start typing module dot exports, right, and then equals to what am I going to put here? App, right. And so what I what this is does if I if I hover over this, if I go module exports. Right is equal to app. This is what I'm putting at the bottom of my code. It's taking my whole Express application, which is my Express object app, and now making it available outside of my server.js file. Nothing is absorbing it. Nothing is uh, consuming this this export. It's just exporting, but there's nothing to take it. There's no place to go. Right, but I'm making it available outside of my server.js file when I do this. So if you look again at my PowerPoint. And this is exactly what we, they've asked us to do, right? We're doing this because later on, we're going to split this up, okay? So everything should be recognizable, which is what it's saying. The only thing that's, that we added was module exports object 
which is used to return the application object. That's what we're doing. We're returning it outside of our application, right? And again, we're using app use to mount, and that's the keyword, mount our middleware. So if I ever ask you on a quiz, if I ever do a quiz, and if I, if I ever ask you something like, you know, what's the what's the right word to use when we use um, middleware, if I ever went there, um, we don't say we're routing. We, we're saying we're mounting the middleware, mounting a middleware function. That's what we're doing. We're actually equivalently registering a listener. That's what we're doing. We're registering a listener, and we're creating an event handler, and that's called mounting. All right. Um, so everything else is, is clear. We're using app use and res send. And this is nice. And notice that the content type header uh, has been removed because now um, res send, right? If you notice that, here's, let me, let me go back to this. See how they use res send instead of res end? Res end, res send. That's a different thing, right? Res send as opposed to res end. And if I was to do that, does it make any changes, right? Well, take a look at this. It says plus one overload, right? One overload means there's a couple of options here. And we're going to talk about those options, right? So they can do, you can do this. Is it, does it have any appreciable difference? So if I go back, you see that the server has been rebooted a bunch of times now because I made some changes. This happens automatically with Nodemon. Right, and if I go back to the web and I refresh my changes, you can see now something happened. Right, see how it moved from welcome the way it was written to welcome with a bit of style, because express. Right, if I kind of go and do a, um, I want to look at this thing. Right, so if I go inspect, notice that now I've got some structure. I never had that before. So express added HTML content immediately, right? That's a whole different thing than end. Let me show you that difference. So I'll go back. It's important to understand the difference between end and send, right? Send, right? End. Now I'm rebooting it, and if I refresh, this. Now look at this, what I'm getting here, right? I'm getting this. Notice how this is all a different font, right? See that? It's far hard to see because I'm not really doing anything here. And it says pre-wrap, word wrap, break word. It still does something because I'm using express and not connect. Connect won't do this. Connect will be blank. This whole thing will be blank except for wet welcome. Not so with, with express. If I go back and go send, just a, you should try this out so you can see what I'm talking about. And if I refresh now, I get this, a different structure, and my I get a default font. This default font is a default style, right? I'm just letting you know because by default, Express will wrap your stuff with a default uh, CSS style that's based on Express, the Express server. So we may have to remove this stuff, right? Just letting you know, because it adds a little bit of margin. Take a look, top and bottom, top and left, right? Adds that in by default. I didn't add in any CSS, right? It does the CSS by default and look at the margin, eight pixels. That's what it does by default. You should understand that from a style perspective. Is that from Express yeah. or from the Chrome default? Express, version? Express. Well, but Chrome, but well, because Express added this in, right? Okay. So you're right. So it's from the Chrome default uh, user agent style. That's what it is. Um, and you can get rid of that by putting a reset, right? But again, how do I add CSS now with Express? You can't the way it is, right? the way we've written it right now. All right, I'm going slow because I want you to understand all the little changes that they made, right? So it's not like you, you uh, were skipping through stuff. All right. Um, so we talked about this. We, we, we can run it with Node. Again, I recommend Nodemon is the better way to do it. Could you run it like this? Absolutely. But whenever we do Node server, we don't we have to restart our server over and over again, right? Let's get into um, the re request and response objects a little bit more, right? So again, there's three different things. I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's listed on their PowerPoints. So I'm not going to read these. I'm going to talk about the key points, and then we're going to take a short break, right? So there's three objects we're going to talk about. The application object app, the request object, which wraps uh, the request we put in, and the response object, which also wraps the response that we come back, that comes back from the server, right? And when I say it's a wrapper, because it's a container, request and response are both containers that contain other properties and other objects, actually, right? So let's get in methods. So here's the application object, right? App set, app set, when we use this, we can set our environment variables for my express application, app set. App get, right? App get, 
Again, this is used for getting the environment variables, right? Now, environment variables, we use them for things like setting it to development mode or, to, uh, you know, kind of our professional build, right? You can kind of go from developer um, in, in a development perspective to deployment, right? Depending on what your build is, if you're ready to deploy, you can set your environment variables differently and you can set it up so that it can detect if it's in deployment mode, it, it kind of serves your files one way. And if it's in development mode, it serves your files in another way. App engine, this is important because we're gonna use this. This is where we tell the um, your application which view engine you're using. In this case, here's an example of require EJS. We can do that EJS um, engine to render our files. App locals for application level variables to re be rendered as templates, we can do that. And there's also app use, which is what we've used already. And app get, that's a different thing. App use and app get, two different options. Right now we're using app use. App use is an express middleware to handle. So again, using a handle. So where you have a path, like we said, this is the, the general form and a callback function, an anonymous function to handle. By the way, you can also make it a named function if you really want to, um, you know, to handle the requests, right? Well, here you have other options, right? With app and, and in this case, verb, right? There's different verbs. There's get and post. And by the way, there's delete and put, right? Those are the other options, right? And again, if you use the get verb, right, you can assign middleware to respond with a uh, what the user what the um, uh, the page renders, and then a post will actually do some post processing on the server side, right? So when someone does a post from their like let's say fills in a form and sends information to the server, the user does that, then that goes to the post side, right? I can post some data, right? So we use post to send data, we use get to get a view. That's typically what we do. So instead of using app use, app use kind of handles both posting or sending. Remember we did that whole middle with the whole wildcard thing. And that's a negative, right? So we're going to use this a little differently when we can use app get and app post those things we're going to change, right? Um, there's also app route, right? Where you can also do things like this app route. And then with a path, this is another, another new form. This is actually newer, a newer way of doing things when you can do things like chained, uh, you know, a chained routing. So you can do get and post in one line. Not bad, not a bad uh, way of doing things at all. And the reason why you want to do this is because of, well, if they send a get request in one line, I can send a, a kind of what the view is going to look like. And then, but if they send a post request, I can chain the, the post, uh, post request to do my uh, processing and send a response, right? And an example of that would be I go to the login page, right? My login page is a get request. I want to see the login. That's what the get is, right? Show me your login page. Okay, here it is. That's that's the response from the get from the login page, right? And then I want to do a um, a post. I, I log in. That's a post request because I'm actually filling in information inside the inside the uh, uh, the form. Once I fill and I, I submit the form, it's a post request. It comes back as a post request because it's coming from the form. And usually, what you want to do in the form document itself, you want to say method post, right? Actually, even if you say method, method get, still the same thing happens, but it's just di different kind of things on the URL. Anyway, so you send this off to the server, and then it returns. It kind of processes your um, your form and sends you maybe somewhere else, redirects you to somewhere else. Like maybe your your login, if you're logged in, it maybe authenticates you or does something else. Right? That's inside the post callback, the function that handles your post, the information that comes from your login page. Is that clear with everybody, or should I draw that up? Because that's one of the biggest problems. All right, you want me to draw it out? No. No. You could use it for validation, but that's not really what we do. Okay, I'll draw it out. I'm sorry. I, I'm not. I don't want to go into it. But if you don't understand this part now, get and post. When we do routing, you're going to be completely confused. Like it's like it's going to be like. Because remember, routing is going to be another file. It's not going to be in our single server file, right? And then you're going to be, wait, what do we do, Tom? How come it's routing? What is it doing, right? And that's why I want to handle this. So please bear with me for people who understand, but I want to kind of make it a more exaggerated example. So I'm going to go to my, again, I, I'm, I've been using Sketchbook Pro lately for whatever reason. Isn't there more than one callback? Because you're doing chain functions. So one callback is for the get, and the other callback is for the in post. One, in one line. 
parameter. Yeah. Parameter. So you're gonna do like a uh, you're gonna see it. You can you can chain it. They show it up online too. I'll show you in a second. Okay. So so here is again um, we have our page right. So our page is this right. And I have a login page, and my login page is going to have things like a form, right? So my form is going to be a container inside my login page. This is my login page, right? So in my login page, you're going to have some information, right, where I'm going to log in. You know, I'm going to put some information, username, password, and usually some kind of button, right? Okay. But this is the login page itself. When I want the login page, I say I put my URL in there. So my, let's say my URL is uh, localhost. So I've got, I don't know, HTTP forward slash forward slash uh, example.com, right? And then log in. That might be my URL, right? Let's analyze this for a second because I'm going to make this smaller. Um, let's analyze this for a second because if this is my path, right? This is my login path, right? So notice that there's two parts to it. There's example.com, which is the, the our domain. And that's going to be the request to, make, to take us to our, I don't know, default route. Right, then there's a login route. The login route is a GET request, right? So what's going to happen on the server side? I'm just going to go back to this for a second. On the server side, here's the server, right? And it's going to respond just to do this. It's going to go to the GET side of the house, right? So we're going to kind of draw another line here. So just to do this, right? This is a GET request, and we're going to put that in there just so you guys see it. GET request. And actually, we usually say GET like this. And usually, you can also say request, like REQ, request. And you see that all, all the time. So get request. We're going to kind of make this font a little smaller so you can see it. And that's what this is. We kind of make a get request, right? And then when we have a, when we submit, we click, click the submit button. So we click the submit button. We actually make a post request, OK? And actually, it doesn't have to be that. But let's, for the for simplicity, we'll use that. OK? So we'll say here, this once we do this, we submit the form, we fill out the form and everything else, we're going to do a post request, right? Two different requests, get and post, right? And it's going to be handled by our route. It's going to be routed separately, right, in our files, one for the get side and one for the post side. And again, like I said, Right, just to draw this out for you. So what happens is when you go to this URL, you get a GET request. The GET request responds by drawing the page. That's what it does. It draws this page out. Nothing, nothing else. Right. Then the user fills out the information and does submit when he or logs in, he clicks the login button. Login button goes to the post request, and the post request goes through the instructions of checking who the user is, making sure that he can access this page, and then redirecting him to uh, secure the, the secure part of the site. That's all the processing that happens, right? It doesn't validate anything. It could validate stuff. That could be hap that could happen on the front end. So you can do things like that. He put the username, is the username long enough? All that stuff. That's the validation. When we talk validation, we, we talk about, did, can I put in some gobbledygook, some weird stuff that's going to break the login page somehow, right? Um, I do validation here. I also do validation here because I make sure that this, this um, URL, this get request is formed properly, right? But then the validation can happen on the post side too. It can say, okay, did the user, when he logged in, is it the proper, is it a username that I recognize? I got to check with the database. Is the username there? Yes, good. Did the password come in correctly? Yes, good. Now, what can this user do? He can do these things. The page is trying to, uh, uh, to access is valid. Fine, redirect him. That's what can all, all that stuff can happen on the post request side. All right, so two different uh, uh, functions can occur, right? And it's almost like having, Little containers that that um, oops undo that little containers that are inside the get request. So there's there's the get request, and then here's the code as an example. That's the uh, the the event handler portion. This is the anonymous function that we run, and here's the post request, and it's going to do this this stuff. All right, so each part can be chained together, right? And this is what they were talking about. This part can be chained together, so these two things can be in one line, and that's what this is doing. It's got this route. We use app route with a request, so uh, the path that we're routing to, and some kind of verb. And this we can use get or post, depending on which one you want to do first. And then right afterwards, you can do a post callback, right? That's why, right? So you can do everything in one line, right? I'm not going to talk param. We'll leave that alone for now and move on. 
Here's the request object. The request object itself carries information. For example, and one of the most common things we use is this request body. The request body is actually the body of everything you've put in. An example of this would be what's inside of your URL request body, right? The post body, this could also be a request body for the post. Remember, there's two, a post or a get is still a request. I'm requesting something from the server, right? My request body from the post side, right, can include things like his username and password. That could be inside the request body, right? By the way, unhashed, right? So they're, they're clear text. I can read it right in the request body if I really want to, whatever the response is, right? Uh, whatever they put in. So again, usually it says the property is included in the body parser middleware. So this will not be active request.body unless we include body parser as our middleware, which we're going to do today, right? So we need body parser to, to parse the request. The request object itself has a bunch of information and body parser allows us to parse the request and have additional information that it, it kind of defines, which is neat, it kind of extends can, uh, express again. So we need to do that. The other things, you know, things like uh, parameters, so we can use it to parse the routing. And this uh, query is a query string of the parameters. We don't need to look at that too much. Um, the other thing is request path. This is neat. Request path. What's the, re the requested path? That's, that's, you know, request host, the request IP. Why is this really important, request IP? That's really cool. I can check who is coming into my site. I can block people from coming in. I can do all kinds of stuff with this request IP. Like, for example, if I want to make a server that only runs locally on the school, I can make sure that the IP range is the right range, right? If it doesn't fall into the range, unauthorized, right? So that's really cool. You get all this information from the request object. Request cookies, right? And we use that with cookie parser because we can't do cookies without this cookie parser middleware, another module we haven't added in yet, right? So those things that we can add in. Let's keep going. The response object, then we'll stop after this and take a short break, okay? I know we've gone for a while. The response object, right? Again, we have our response status code. Is it status code 200? That means everything's okay. Is it status code, four, status code 404? If it's status code 404, that means it's not found, right? Lots of stuff we can get from the response object, right? And it's gonna respond with that stuff uh, to the web, back to the website, back to the user, right? Um, response set. Okay, this is where we want a response to set the header. If we want to set the header with something. Response cookie. So again, RES stands for response. That's why I'm just saying response, response, right? Response cookie. Okay, and we can talk about things like responding with a cookie. This is the most common way I use it. Response redirect, right? So I can check to see if the status is okay, depending on the status, and then I redirect to a specific URL, right? So again, um, if nothing is passed, if nothing is changed, the, the response is going to be everything is nothing's changed, um, as an example. So 302, and then it's going to respond. But usually, you don't. You, this is here in square brackets from a general form perspective. What does that mean when you read general form? Optional, Optional right? So you don't have to have the status. You can just say a response redirect to the URL, and you can redirect them directly. Okay. So then, remember for your for your uh, lab today, response redirect, right? I could use response redirect to redirect into a URL a whole page if I want to, yeah? Let's try that out before we stop, right? So let's go back to this. And now I have response send, but I wanna have two pages, right? And I wanna have them in the root of my project right here. I don't know why I do this, but let's do it. I'm gonna put an index.html page in here. If you really wanna make a simple app, you could do this. I put some simple HTML, so we need the doc type, right? right? and an HTML object, and inside the HTML object, we're going to have both a head, I know people hate when I do this, and then a body tag, huh? I, like that. I use it all the time. And then inside my head object, I'm going to have a title, right? And maybe inside the title, I'm also going to inc include some other additional stuff in there. So I'm going to put some other stuff inside the head of my object, right? Like, for example, I, I did that wrong. <clears throat> I did that wrong. Um, I'm going to put some meta tags in there. So here's maybe one meta tag or two meta tags. So maybe plus meta, a couple of meta tags in there. And maybe my meta tag is going to have some um, other stuff in there. Like, for example, character set is equal to UTF-8. You can do that, too, with square brackets. And this meta tag, if I really want to form it out, I can write it. I'm not going to do that one. 
uh, it's just a little longer. But my title, maybe my title is going to have a title of, you know, um, you know, kind of welcome, which I can put in, in curly braces, welcome. That also does that. And then in my body tag, I'm going to have some other stuff in there. So I'm going to include, it's a big long one, right? Uh, in my body tag, I'm going to have, um, you know, kind of an H1 tag, right, as an example. And I'm also going to have next to that some kind of paragraph tag. And I want to put those in brackets because the brackets, what they do is they separate my the kind of order of operations kind of thing, right? So there we go. And then uh, that should do it. Uh, we'll see. And then uh, if, it, if I am, I am, right? Um, and then we'll go back and fix it. So uh, H1 tag and H1 tag is going to have a, you know, kind of a welcome in there. And then we're going to go up to the paragraph tag and inside there we're going to have lorem text of uh, 50, right? So big long file, right? Big long uh, thing, right? And for you guys to see that, I'll see if I can make it all visible. There it is, right? Okay, so that's one big thing. And when I press tab, if I did it right, then I get all this. Let me undo that so you can see that again. Right? It's called Emmet for the people who haven't seen it before. Right, uh, there might be some people in, in in the class that haven't seen that. And and the rate the way you write it is, if you want to put an attribute, you use square brackets. If you want to put in actual text, or uh, stuff that's inside of uh, an element, the inner child, if you will, of the element, inner child, it's my inner child. Um, you can use uh, uh, curly braces, and you can combine those. You can also use dot for classes. For example, if I want to put this body uh, in my H1 tag and paragraph tag inside of a some kind of div tag with a class of container. You can do that div tag with a class of container, and then what you want to do is this is in this all this stuff is inside of this. That would probably work too, I'm guessing, right? And then if I go over here, if it doesn't work, by the way, I can always go back and I press tab, and then it's all that in there, right? So then you can see what I got, right? I got I got all this stuff inside of the class of container with an H1 tag and a paragraph tag. And, and, and if you keep on adding, you can keep on going back and just add more stuff. So inside my div tag with a class of container, I want to have a div tag with a class of row. right? And inside my div tag with a class of row, I can go a div tag, oops, a div tag with a class of column-medium-offset-3 and another one which is column-medium, if I go crazy, right? Dash six, right? And then put that in there. And you can see if I go tab, I get all that, right? Pretty crazy, right? So I think this is a really cool way of doing that uh, really quickly. I don't have any CSS, and I haven't included Bootstrap. I'm not going to do Bootstrap. I just showed, I wanted to show you that just to play, um, where my name is equal to viewport here for this one, my viewport tag, and where content is equal to width is equal to device staff. If you've done any course with me, uh, you know what this means. This is for responsive design, right? And then initial dash scale is equal to one. So the initial scale of the width is one, right? This is just generic uh, tags. And maybe my head tag, sorry, my HTML is going to be of language, which is equal to English localization, right? English, right? And I can keep going, but I'm not going to. This is just a big, basic page, right? Which is made. And I want you guys to understand how to do this kind of stuff too. When you work in a, in a, in a, in a place, right? You should be able to scaffold out a HTML uh, document like this very quickly. Right, because it's a waste of time. This is just like you're just structuring your your HTML, right? You want to be able to do that. Okay, now that I have this, I know I can go somewhere with my index.html, which means I can do a res dot redirect. Let's try that. So I'm going to go back to my, my files. I have an index.html file to go to, and I have my server.js, which is right here. And instead of doing a res send, can I do a res dot redirect, right? to a URL string, which is one of the options. And if you look down here in Visual Studio Code, I have options to go through the other things here, right? So there's other things here. I can go status number on the end, right? I can do URL string and that returns void, right? Or I can do URL string there with a status number in the beginning. Those are the three um, constructors. How does the known data type? Well, if I told you that, I'd, I'd, give away, I'd give away too much information, Aaron. Come on. It knows the data type because of the, what you're passing in. It's than it, it kind of makes some um, uh, implicit casting. Okay, so redirect, and then I want to get, get to that URL. Uh oh, is, do I put an in index.html in here? What do I put in here? Can I put in localhost four slash? Uh, da, da, da? I could do that all that too if I really want to. Crazy. Or if I want to redirect to an IP address one nine two dot one six eight dot whatever, you can do that or some other IP address, and then 
it's a full URL, whatever the URL is. Does it work? That's the question. Does it go to my hello? Right? And tell me why. Now remember, I'm using welcome here, and here's my hello. And tell me why it will not or will or will not work from the get go. Will it work? No. Will this response redirect work? Why? You don't have that root set up. I don't have that root set up, my index.html. There is no index.html set up, right? No root, no index.html. It's not going to go there. This redirects to a root. Uh oh. What do I do? Right? It's a nice idea. We're going to keep that file, by the way. But, but a response redirect, let's try this out. So I'm going to try it. Uh, so I go back to here. Notice that I've rebooted my server a bunch of times, right? And if I go back to the actual server side and I re kind of go refresh, does this part. And I just want to show you something. If I go to hello and I press enter, it still takes me back to this. Now is a problem because look, it's trying to go to index.html. It's actually done the redirection. The redirection is complete. It's trying to go to index.html, but there is no index.html root. I'm trying to, I'm requesting another thing, right? Index.html. What if I took this out? Would that solve it? No, because I don't have a root for that. I don't have a root for index.html. It's not showing me this thing, index.html. So we're going to be talking about how to do this. How do I do that? All the redirect does is it redirects, it changes our URL string, our request to something else, right? So if I want to redirect back to the home page, I would redirect like this. So I would redirect like just go back like this. That would redirect back to the whole the home page, right? And I'll show you this. So if I press hello, it doesn't matter whether I press hello or this, it's going to just say welcome, right? But it's never going to get to my index.html. Watch, refresh, right? Okay. If I go to hello, it's hard to see this because you know here it is. Press oops, that's not what I wanted. And if I go Hello, still going to go to welcome, right? How about if I did it the other way around? If I took this, let's just leave this alone for now. And that's my, what if I did something like this? If, I, if they both redirected to hello, like they both redirected to themselves, is that bad? It's called like in an infinite, infinite loop. It'll just keep, it'll keep on flashing like this and it won't stop. It might even give an error still eventually. Stop. Some modern browser. Yeah, might, so example will be if somehow you did something like this for kind of kind of goes to itself. Where time becomes a loop. Sorry, <laughs> I'd say that. If I go back to this and I re refresh, now you're going to have some other thing going on, right? Where it kind of goes down to the localhost page isn't working. Redirected you too many times. It's going to redirect too many times. It's going to keep on redirecting over and over and over and over and over and over back to itself, and you don't want to you do that kind of thing. This route exists, you know, but that's why it's dangerous to use this wildcard routing. It's a catch-all. It'll catch every other page that's in there. Let's stop, take a break, and when we come back, we'll continue with routing. And I think I wanna, we wanna keep doing this so we understand uh, how it all works. Mm -hmm.